Imparting a deliberate spirituality to our choirs involves many things, as we've come to discover over our time together. It involves taking intentional time to create quiet, to find space to pray and to reflect together. It involves framing our experiences in moments that actually give us permission to speak of our faith openly and honestly. It involves a repertoire that helps us to adopt a stance of admiration when it comes to the vast diversity of cultures and expressions of this world. It also involves the opportunity for choral directors to talk about our songs and place them in context. We need to tell stories about where our repertoire came from, who authored them, and our own role in taking part in the continuation of this sung faith tradition. And I'd like to offer a few examples here. There is a song in the repertoire of the folk choir called All Will Be Well. Now before I introduce it to the ensemble, even if I know there are some in the group that already know it, I choose to tell a story about it. The story is of a woman in her 30s, a mystic at a church in Norwich in England. Somehow, she manages to live through the horrible plagues and diseases of her time. And out of this came from her writings a verse, a verse that has become one of the most hope-filled passages of our time. All shall be well, and all shall be well, and all manner of things shall be well. The woman is Julian of Norwich, a mystic of 15th century England. The text she wrote was The Revelations of Divine Love. Then I go on to tell the story of the death of a contemporary, Cardinal Joseph Bernadine of the Archdiocese of Chicago. I tell my students of how when Bernadine died and WGN covered his passage for that entire day, they repeatedly went back again and again to the playing of All Will Be Well in their broadcasts. The story shows how a text that is more than 500 years old still finds a powerful place in the electronic media of our present world. When our students begin to sing this song, I think they understand better that they're not just singing notes. They're stepping into a living history of a verse that has existed from the 15th century, was reset to music in the 20th century, and is now part of a repertoire that has been sung on both sides of the Atlantic Ocean. This is one way to teach. It is by history, story, and song, the weaving together of church writings and tradition, and placing them in a musical and liturgical context. But there are other ways as well, and this is just by using songs as tools for spiritual growth. This is what I mean. Before we start a liturgy with our folk choir ensemble on a Sunday morning, you can be reasonably assured of two things. We begin with a Baroque piece for our instrumentalists, something that our singers can ponder and take in with careful listening. But following that, it's the chorister's turn to do a prelude, and the style of that second prelude is almost always the same. Here we choose to do what would be called a Christian mantra, a short four-part refrain, oftentimes with verses that are laid over the refrain. All Will Be Well was written in this style. It is also the style of music of the ecumenical community of Taizé in France. Mantras are special tools in spiritual life. They are not linear. They don't move from point A to point B. They progress in a circle, and by doing so, there is a certain mystery about them. In their repetitive nature, by chanting the lyrics over and over again, one is drawn deeper and deeper into the mystery of the message. 
It would be quite one thing to simply sing this kind of music every week and not say anything about it. But both the choosing of this type of song and our performance of it affords a teaching moment for the ensemble. Why sing a mantra? I ask the question of my students. We sing it because it affords us the opportunity to step out of time, to enter into a bit of eternity. And eternity is depicted by a circle. It doesn't have a beginning or an end, and it isn't linear. We talk about a lot of things that don't end in our liturgies. The mystery of love, the unceasing song of the angels, the cherubim and the seraphim, God, the Alpha and the Omega, all the prayers and collects that conclude with forever and ever, Amen. And here is a kind of song that actually illustrates, in sonic form, these very ideas. But more than this, mantras allow us, the singers and the participants, to also get away from the linear behavior of the secular world that surrounds us. Resumes, finances, homework, checkbooks, outside worries, relationships, the baggage of concerns and fretful dispositions within us. Saying things over and over again, to say nothing of the power of singing things over and over again. This allows us to savor, to let the message permeate, to prepare our hearts for the profound mystery of prayer and praise that follows in the Eucharist. In a previous session, I mentioned the singing of the Salve Regina at the end of our Tuesday night rehearsals. This text also provides a rich instruction for our students, partly because of what they are wearing. By the time they are seniors, our students have more than likely purchased their class ring. And right on the side of that ring is the seal of our university, embedding the words Vita Dulcedo Spes in the setting. These three words, our life, our sweetness, and our hope, are the ones they sing every week on Tuesday nights, and they wear these words on their finger. But it's not the ring that matters. It's finding ways to connect the dots of their spiritual and musical landscape with the things around them. So as choral directors, you might ask yourself the same. It may not be a class ring, but there may be other points of connectivity that help you drive your spiritual message home. And then, finally, there is the sense of what we are meant to do in this world, how we are sent forth, the true meaning of who we are in a choir. This is my final example, and it's actually the way I want to end my reflections with you today. Every year, our choir experiences a profound fracturing. We lose a quarter of our ensemble to the reality of graduation. Whether we like it or not, our seniors have to move on and go out, out into the world, out to become the hands and the voices of Christ we've prepared them to be. How do we accomplish this transition? You can see through all the examples I've spoken of already that most of what goes on in our choir is deliberate, and such is the case as well with graduation and commencement, with our leave-taking. The first event of every graduation weekend at Notre Dame is a beautiful service called The Last Visit to the Grotto and the Basilica. 
It's a chance for our seniors to share scripture, laugh over the antics of the last four years, bestow an award on a teacher who has left a profound impact on their lives, and in a great way to acknowledge, sometimes with deep sorrow, that an important chapter of their lives is coming to an end. But even though there is sorrow, it is the complementary side to many years of great joy and growth. In the choir loft that evening, the entire assembly is gathered in the pews, and at the end of the service, the seniors both downstairs who have gathered in the pews and the seniors from the choir begin the solemn and deliberate procession to the grotto by candlelight. We sing them out of church, blessing them musically with the words of John Cardinal Newman as we sing the hymn, Lead Kindly Light. But before we even get into church, earlier in the evening, I take some time at our final rehearsal to prepare them for this moment. I speak of the fraction rite at Mass, that place where the bread is broken and we sing the Lamb of God. I speak to them about how the bread must be broken so that many others may be fed. And the exact same thing is true with us. We must often break ourselves apart from what is known and comfortable so that others may be fed as well. This catechetical moment, this catechesis on the last visit to the grotto, is by no means a singular moment in the yearly life of our choir. Week to week, little stories will pop up in rehearsal, stories about the saints who wrote the verses, or a contemporary event at which one of our songs was used, or a theological or liturgical insight like the one above that will help all the more with our students' understanding of the song and complement their own spiritual growth. Then we send them out, out into that warm May night and out into the world that awaits them. Here then is what I hope are some simple things that can help a choir move in positive and creative ways, both in their own individual faith life and likewise enriching the community within which they serve. We work to make sure they understand their role as leaven for the assembly. We try to create an atmosphere that cultivates reflection and honors silence as the backdrop to all their music. We try to move beyond the places we know so that we can see God and take God to communities beyond our own. We try to emulate a kind of joy that embraces the diverse cultures of our human family, taking a spirit of admiration to all those unfamiliar sounds, languages, and customs that are beyond our own. And finally, through our song and our ritual, we try to teach lessons far beyond the notes and the words on the printed page lessons of love and leave-taking, lessons that open hearts to the amazing tradition of our faith, lessons that place us firmly in a prayerful stance before our Creator. May God, the author of all song and the eternal choir master, lead you and your ensemble ever closer to the mystery of His divine love.